wow, it's my first Hackers Congress. This is amazing. What an incredible event. Thank you so much uh, for coming here today. I really appreciate it. Um, this talk will be on video in a couple of weeks uh, on my YouTube channel, but also um, it is licensed under Creative Commons attribution. You can do whatever you want with it, pretty much. So uh, feel free if you ha do use a recording, or you can just take it from my YouTube channel whenever you want. Thanks for coming. The talk is going to be called a tsunami of innovation. And what I want to talk about today is innovation in open systems. You've probably heard me talk about this before. One of the defining characteristics of the Bitcoin blockchain, but also of other open blockchain systems, is something we call permissionless innovation. And permissionless innovation is the idea that in a system that is decentralized, where people can connect to the system without asking for permission, where they can create their own applications without asking permission, and they can launch these applications and use the platform without asking for permission, something magical happens. The best example of this, of course, is the internet. And on the internet, you don't need permission to create a new application. You can assign it some port numbers, you can write an application protocol, you can distribute a binary or source code. Anybody can run it, and if they run it, they become your market for that application. So what is the minimum market size you need to run an application on the internet? Two. <laughs> Two nodes, two people, two systems. As long as two systems want to use a protocol to communicate with each other, that is an application. That is an application market. That is the basis for running a new application. And you don't need anybody's permission to innovate on this system. And why is this important? Because in closed and permission systems, innovation is determined by the least common denominator. If you want to run an application on the phone company's network, you have to find a way to persuade them that this is an application that will be broadly used by millions of people who are participating in that. And you have to ask for permission. And only if your application has a very large market share will it ever run. And the essence of permissionless innovation is that you do two things. One, you create the possibility of micro-innovation, innovation for a market of two, a special purpose application that nobody in the world cares about, except for these two people or these two systems. And they can do micro-innovation in a tiny, tiny environment, and create exciting new applications for which the only two people who are excited are the ones participating in that application. And that's enough. So it's hyperlocal, micro-innovation. But at the very same time, it's also a platform for macro, global innovation. The very same application that appeals to two people can go two people, 2,000 people, 20,000 people, 200,000 people, 2 million people, 2 billion people. You're probably going to need to optimize the code a bit. <laughs> But you have the possibility of simultaneously appealing to an audience as small as two, all the way up to a completely global audience, all without asking for anyone's permission. This critical function is offered by Bitcoin and other open blockchains by the virtue of open access, by the virtue of a neutral platform that is not controlled by a central entity, by the virtue of being able to use that platform to develop your own applications. And what happens with that is something that people often underestimate. And we've seen how big markets underestimate the possibility of innovation on the internet. And there's a reason why. You can easily underestimate this form of innovation. If you're a big bank or a big corporation, and you're paying 
a thousand very expensive, highly trained professional developers, you have the cream of the crop. You have the best of the best innovating for you in a focused and directed manner. How could anyone compete with that? How could anyone compete with that budget, that marketing, that infrastructure, that support? I mean, it's almost ridiculous to think that you could take decentralized innovation and make it work on a large scale. Maybe you can do it for things that are not important. You can play with your little internet toys. We have important work to do here in our large corporation. And one day, some bored student at the University of Finland, who can't afford to buy Microsoft Windows, comes up with the most ridiculous idea. I'm going to write a scalable, multi-processing operating system that competes with Unix. Right? And the only response to that by any sane individual is, <laughs> that's ridiculous. There's no way that will ever work. Twenty years later, Linux has completely taken over every data center, every computer operating system. Most of the people in this room are running it underneath their Android operating system, which is really just Linux built up. This audacity that you can out-innovate the largest players on the planet combines with something really important. Passion interest and deep knowledge of the community of your users. And it's most powerful when the developers are the community of the users or come straight out of the community of the users. And when you have people who are developing an application that is for their own interest, that they have emotional attachment to, that they feel passion for, they will commit enormous amount of effort into building that and treat it with great care. Why? Because at the end of it, software is art. And so, just like an artist, if you lack creativity, if you lack that spark, you can have a corporation that hires as many in-house artists as you want. You're never going to create great art. It will be soulless. It will be empty. And that's what happens to innovation. When innovation is brought into large companies, it goes there to die. When they send their employees to workshops and seminars to teach them how to think creatively, in a four-hour seminar on a Wednesday afternoon, innovation goes there to die. Creativity goes there to die. And if, by some miracle, an inspired creator arises, from within the corporation, create something truly unique, creative, disruptive, expressive. The entire mechanism of bureaucracy will stomp down on that idea and kill it very, very quickly. Tommy, we love your idea and your creativity. This is really a fantastic invention you've brought to us. Now, we have conducted a focus group and assembled a committee. And we don't want to interfere with your creative process. We have a few minor suggestions to help it be more broadly appealing among our customers and more in line with our strategic goals. And that is the corporate sound of stomp on creativity. By the time that idea comes out of committee, it is a pale image, a skeleton of what it once was. And everything good and creative and wonderful about it has been sucked out, and what's left is a soulless corporate piece of shit. And yet, when presented with decentralized innovation, when shown the potential of everyone on the planet, independently and on their own, being able to innovate on the internet, to create content, to create beautiful works of art, 
to contribute to human knowledge. When presented with the idea that an open blockchain allows everyone in the world to create applications, they underestimate it. They cannot fathom how an unruly mess of untrained, untutored, and unpaid volunteers can ever compete with their finely geared machine. And every time they miss the point. And this happens again and again, and you see it through history. You would think, by now, after 20 years of observing the internet at work, this lesson would come through. But instead, what you see is corporate organizations and governments having innovation workshops, speaking about disrupting from within, <laughs> and all of this empty talk. When I was at the hackathon we did a couple of days ago, I found out that uh, one of the key contributors to an amazing piece of software that was written revealed himself to be a 14-year-old kid from London with no formal training in programming, who is outclassing many of the professional programmers in the space with passion. And that is the most dangerous form of competition a company can face. That is unstoppable. Here's why it's easy to underestimate the potential for innovation. When you place two systems side by side, and one of them has a 200-year tradition of slow and careful and methodical development, institutionalized knowledge, and a solid foundation of trust. The banking system. And then you bring this ragtag group of weirdo anarchists. I'm looking at you. <laughs> With funny haircuts and too many piercings, and wear t-shirts who can't wear a suit and they say we're going to reinvent banking what can you do but laugh right because the first version of what they present to the world is woefully inadequate it's kludgy it's difficult to use it hasn't been tested by a focus group the design sucks completely and so you compare the two and you say, this is what they've done, this is what it took us 200 years to do, and you laugh. Because there's no chance this little ragtag group of misfits is ever possibly going to compete with millions and millions of dollars in your budget. But what you're missing is the most important part of the equation. When everyone is open to innovate without permission, and when the outcome of their innovation is open sourced and available to everybody else to copy, incorporate, integrate, mash up, and build upon, what happens is an exponential curve. Every tiny idea is fed by a thousand other tiny ideas and in turn spawns a new forest of tiny ideas that together create another generation of tiny ideas, and gradually all of these things start building up. People who are free to do and follow their passion start creating applications you couldn't even imagine. And they build on other people's work and give ideas to other people who then build on top of these. And the momentum increases. And it takes a long time for that momentum to build up. And it's very, very gradual at first. The key characteristic of an exponential curve is that for the majority of its life cycle, it appears to be a slowly climbing horizontal line. It looks like it's taking a very long time to catch up with that plateau of 200 years of innovation. And then, surprise! Because here's the one thing I can tell you about exponential curves. They have an elbow, and the elbow is the inflection point where the horizontal becomes vertical, where all of the cumulative momentum building and building and building suddenly reaches that critical point, and it starts accelerating faster 
and faster and faster. And it takes a very long time for these applications to reach parity, to appear to do the same thing that the established industry does. But the thing about an exponential curve is that one month after reaching parity, it's exceeded by an order of magnitude, and one year it's exceeded by two orders of magnitude. And while the traditional institution continues its slow horizontal curve, the exponential curve suddenly turns vertical. We've seen this happen on the internet. We've seen this happen throughout many technologies in our lifetime. Ray Kurzweil, an esteemed author, has written a fantastic work called The Singularity is Near. I spoke recently at the Singularity University, which is an organization founded by Ray Kurzweil. And we discussed these issues of exponential growth. These exponential curves can be seen in many places in our post-industrial society. The acceleration of density of computer chips, computer memory, speed of processing, amount of data you can send through communication, the number of documents on the web, the number of documents on Wikipedia, the number of people connected to the internet, the number of internet of things systems connected to each other, the number of people working on Bitcoin, the number of contributions to the Bitcoin core, the number of alternative blockchains poking up, all of these lines have one thing in common. They exhibit an exponential curve. And for all of these, when you look at it as a, as a human being, we tend to massively underestimate the impact of these exponential curves, because we cannot fathom exponential growth. It is alien to nature. It only happens in very limited circumstances, and it's always surprising. We extrapolate linearly. We see the past, and we think that it will continue at the same pace in the future. What we miss is the elbow in the curve when things turn vertical. The amount of data that you could fit on a storage device in the 60s was pitiful. You can watch photos online of IBM unloading a five megabyte hard drive from a truck with four people carrying it. Right? And it takes a very long time to go from five megabytes to ten megabytes to a hundred megabytes. But before long you stop counting in megabytes and you're counting in gigabytes and then terabytes and the curve is vertical. And we see this with data, we see this with participation on the internet, and we're beginning to see it with Bitcoin. I use the phrase tsunami of innovation, because one characteristic of a tsunami, a wave in the ocean, a massive disturbance in the liquid structure of the ocean, is that the wave propagation happens at depth. If you're a fisherman, and you're 500 miles out from the coast, and a tsunami passes, you can't even distinguish it from the other waves. It's a little slush that passes you by. There's 200 feet of slush underneath that you can't see, and it's held at depth. And then the wave reaches the continental shelf. And as it hits the edge of the continental shelf, it climbs. And by the time it hits the beach, it's 200 feet high. And if you were looking out in the ocean, it's like, oh, it's a little wave. Oh, it's a medium wave. Oh, it's a big wave. Oh, shit, run for the hills. This is going to be the experience of institutionalized banking. This is going to be the experience of institutional regulation of government. This is going to be the experience of decentralized innovation on the web. This is going to be the experience of applications of trust. This is going to be the experience of the blockchain-powered Internet of Things. Every organization that is observing this is going to say, Oh, it's an interesting concept. Oh, it's kind of very interesting. Oh, it's getting kind of bigger. Oh, shit, run for the hills. 
the first indication you have, in fact, is that the water recedes. And that's the wrong time to go sunbathing on the beach. Right now, it is very easy to underestimate the innovative potential of Bitcoin. Right now, you see the early stage prototype. Right now, you see the beginnings of a system that has some promise. But its biggest promise is not in what is there, it is in what is to come. And the reason the promise lies in what is to come is because of the power of innovation without permission, by individuals who have a particular interest, an interest that is not served and will never be served by the current system. Let's look at just one example. Let's say you are a person with a disability. You have a problem with your hearing, or your sight, or a cognitive problem. You have some kind of difficulty with numbers, dysnumeria, or with words, dyslexia. And what can you ask your bank to do to make your life easier? Can you ask them to modify the online banking application to make it more suitable to you? Can you ask them to modify their ATMs to make it more useful to you? With great resistance, they might try to serve you. In fact, they will be able to do it a lot easier on the web than they can do it on their ATM network or their physical locations. Now imagine what happens if you are a software engineer and you have a disability. Or if you are a software engineer and your best friend, your cousin, has a disability. And you look at Bitcoin and you say, my friend doesn't have a good way of remembering pin numbers. He would be or she would be much better served with pictures of animals. My friend doesn't have a good way of visualizing small information. She would be better served by the information being magnified. My friend doesn't have good understanding of social engineering and cognitive threats. He or she would be better served by a community management through multisig. How many people do you need to persuade to write that application? No one. You write it. You improve the world in a tiny way for one person. and Others will find it. and They will say, this is the application I have always been looking for. I now have been empowered by the innovation of a complete stranger, and I can use it. And the tsunami builds, and the momentum builds, and every single developer operating in this space. We're not solving big universal problems. We're solving small local problems that matter to us. Because we control where we want to invest, our creative energy and our passion. And there is nothing in the world that can stop that once it gains momentum. It is an absolute tsunami of innovation, and it is coming. Thank you. So, um, we have an hour, and uh, I don't want to bore you with my talk uh, anymore. And I would love to have a conversation uh, with any and all of you. So um, I think we have a couple of microphones here for the audience. Uh, if you would like to ask me a question, I would be delighted to answer it for you. Um, thank you. Hi. Um, great to see you in real life. Um, just wanted to ask. I read an article recently that said the European Union is planning to register all Bitcoin uh, users and their transactions and keep a database of all of this in a centralized manner. Yes. Um, just want to know your opinion on that and how you think that would move forward and what kind of resistance they would face or if it's even possible. Um, one of the uh, really interesting. So the question was about the European Union creating a registration database of. Uh, of some Bitcoin users, um, because the idea that they can create a registration database of all Bitcoin users 
is a pipe dream. And, uh, I think several people in this room would make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> in an open system, people have choices. And decentralization and centralization are not an equal symmetric scale. In order for a centralized system of control to be effective, it has to be near absolute. But in order for a decentralized system to provide freedom, it doesn't have to be absolute. All it has to do is undermine the system of control. If you have a stadium with a concert, and the stadium has a hundred doors, how many of those doors do you need to check tickets for that concert to not be a free concert? One hundred doors. Ninety-nine doors is not enough. because The moment one of the doors is not being checked, everybody texts everybody. Nobody shows up at the ninety-nine doors you are checking, and they all go through the back door, and you have a free concert. Control has to be complete has to be end-to-end -end for it to be even marginally effective. But it gets worse. Because what happens if you have a system where some people, those who are educated, technically literate, or motivated enough, can choose to use the back door, can choose to use the system without registration, can be nimble enough with their communications and their protocols and their use of Tor and all of the other things that they might need to use the system that isn't registered. Who are you left monitoring? The innocent and the idiots. And everybody who perhaps you should be monitoring is choosing to use the unmonitored avenues. And there are thousands of unmonitored ways to do. You cannot impose end-to-end -end control on a completely open protocol that is global in nature, that uses the internet as its underlying mechanism, that is, in essence, a content type, a form of speech, a communication medium on the internet. You cannot control it. Do you know why I know that? Because they can't even control it in North Korea. You can get American movies depicting American actors killing a simulation of Kim Jong-un in North Korea on a USB drive. I imagine the penalty that applies to that is a bit higher than what the European Union will be able to pass legislatively. <laughs> and yet they can't stop it. And if you can't stop it there, what chance do you have of stopping it in a multicultural society like the European Union, or in an open borders world like the one that Bitcoin creates. Let them try. They are wasting their time, and it gets worse. Because what are they going to end up doing? They are going to end up collecting the private information of millions of people who, by the definition that I just gave you, are innocent and some idiots. They will collect all of these people's information and they will create one of the European Union's largest honeypots of private information and then they will fail to secure it as they always do because there is no way to secure concentrated data and it will get hacked and they will end up hurting the consumers that they are actually pre pre presenting as protection right so, one, it doesn't work for the stated reason of protecting against criminal activity, because if the criminals have a choice, they won't subject themselves to it. One of the characteristics of a criminal is that they don't follow the law. Go figure. <laughs> two, it will actually reduce the ability to innovate within the European Union, and it will harm most the properly organized, legitimate small businesses that are creating jobs in this space. And three, finally, after failing to achieve all of its goals, it will hurt the very citizens that it aims to protect, because it will expose their private information. And we're going to see this happen again and again and again in this world. Thank you.
Let's take another question. Okay, we have a question from uh, uh, people watching the stream. Uh, so I'm going to read it from, from the phone. Oh, uh, thank you. What there about you Bitcoin democracy and uh, profiling specialized Bitcoin mining companies gaining more and more power over Bitcoin network? Do you see this decentralization of Bitcoin network to be a danger, dangerous thing or not? Uh, I, I think he meant centralization. But. Yes. Um, Bitcoin mining is currently centralized, uh, and my theory is the reason that Bitcoin mining and mining pools have become centralized is because over a period of seven years, we saw an approximately one million times increase in the performance of mining equipment. We saw essentially two decades worth of um, development of semiconductor capacity and density express itself in seven years in Bitcoin. From Mining on a laptop, which was what Satoshi did during the first several months, even in two years, to mining on a graphics card, to mining on a field programmable gate array, to mining finally on A6 at 60 nanometers, and then A6 at 48 nanometers, and then A6 at 36 nanometers, and A6 at 24, A6 at uh, 18, 16, and now we're hitting that level where it's about at 16 to 12 nanometers. Basically, what you've done is you've replayed the history of the semiconductor industry in seven years, in fast motion. And what that means is that if you create a piece of mining equipment in a semiconductor fab in Shenzhen, it has approximately um, 12 weeks of usable life before it is obsolete. Now, how far can you get this piece of equipment in 12 weeks and make it useful? If you put it on a ship, it leaves Shenzhen as a highly sophisticated piece of very expensive electronics, and it arrives in Los Angeles 16 weeks later as scrap metal. So instead, you get hired to build it, it goes on a truck, it ends up in a warehouse in the neighboring province, hooked up to power as quickly as possible, where it sits on a shelf for one month, one and a half, two months at most, and then it gets thrown away, and the cycle starts again. That automatically means you can't expand the availability of these equipment. But something magical has just happened, and nobody has really noticed it. We hit the front of Moore's law. We went from performance increases of 1,000 or more per year to 2x, two times better, every 18 months. That's Moore's law. In every other area of computing, Moore's law is amazingly fast. In Bitcoin mining, it is 10,000 times too slow. Now, that piece of equipment that comes out at 16 nanometers cannot be obsoleted for two years, because there is no better than 16 nanometers. You have to invent the technology, build the factory. And so that piece of equipment can now travel broadly. In fact, having a warehouse full of this equipment is now a disadvantage. Because if you put all of the equipment in one warehouse and it burns down, you lose all of your capital. If you put it all in one warehouse and your workers go on strike, you lose all of your capital. If you put it in one warehouse and your power is cut for four days, you lose all of your capital. But if you take 100,000 of these devices and you sell them, and they get plugged into 100,000 kitchens, and they're used to make hot water for tea, then the re reliability and resilience of that network changes dramatically. So I believe that uh, the Bitcoin mining ecosystem is going to get re-decentralized, because the fundamental economic pressure that existed, the most important economic pressure, has now changed dramatically. It's going to take at least two years until we see the impact. Um, I also think people overestimate how much actual power the miners have that doesn't involve them destroying their own financial interests. Um, and finally, quite honestly, if Bitcoin failed to achieve its decentralization potential, um, there are many people who understand how it works, and so we'd start with a new one. I don't think that's going to be necessary, uh, but if it is necessary, um, I would like to buy some <laughs> when it first starts. <laughs> All right. I Thank think you. the question also covered uh, the uh, not so open innovation access to Bitcoin Core commit, uh, right? So mm -hmm. not everyone can actually develop the Bitcoin Core software. There are some 
doors you need to pass first. So what about this uh, democracy? Of course, there are other alternative blockchains, so you can always move away, but... There are alternative options, and the reason Bitcoin Core is the choice of many of the companies that choose to use that, and many of the users that choose to run the software, is because at the moment they deliver better software. And How do I know that? Because the market chooses to use it. Uh, this is an open market-based system. You can write your own, and if it's better, it will win. And you can write, and I would very much doubt that if you have uh, commits that are broadly viewed as valuable to the ecosystem, you'll have any difficulty getting them added uh, to Bitcoin Core uh, or any of the other platforms that work around Bitcoin. It's a multi-layered system, and we're going to see. Now, uh, granted, we do have some elements that are more centralized than I would like, uh, but I have faith that over the long term, uh, the important things are maintained and maintained well. Okay, who else wants to ask me a question? Thanks for the great talk. Um, I view Bitcoin as a distributed but centralized system mm -hmm. because it, it looks to me that it, uh, to make any changes on a protocol level, you need to have the majority of the miners to agree to that. And we can see it with a blockchain debate, a block size debate, for example. What's your take on that? I think what the block size debate uh, demonstrates is that if there is a bottleneck in one part of the development process, what happens is that um, uh, different paths emerge. If people find alternative ways to achieve the same goal uh, that are perhaps more creative. So we've seen the development of uh, both alternative clients. We've seen the development of better mechanisms for estimating fees and prioritizing transactions, which was really critical for the stability of the network, but we've also seen the development of second layer technologies, side chains and um, lightning network and bidirectional payment channels and things like that, and quite honestly, segregated witness and some of the other trans uh, transactional optimizations that are coming out of, of core itself. So um, I don't think there's any limit to the number of choices that may be presented to solve the scaling problem. And uh, quite honestly, it's not a dire problem uh, if people are not trying uh, to bypass the system that we have. And, and the truth is, people are not. If the miners thought it was a dire problem and it affected their financial interest, they would switch uh, in a day, and we would see alternatives. Also, you know, quite honestly, we have a broad open market for competition. And so other systems choose to use bigger blockchain uh, block sizes, uh, different rates of transaction creation, etc. Now, the argument is that that ends up centralizing the system even more, and um, that some efficiency is the price you pay for liberty. And the nice thing about this is that you have this whole ecosystem where all of these questions can be resolved in a way that is completely voluntary. So people can voluntarily choose to use the currency of their choice, the blockchain of their choice, the client of their choice, the software of their choice. And by having these choices, they push the development in the direction that the market wants to go. And the, the amazing thing about having something like Bitcoin is it opened the door to give you choices. And now that we have the door open, you can switch your Bitcoin into any other currency in less than two minutes using a variety of open systems um, and in a very anonymous way even. And so if you have choices, the question is, what are you saying? Are you saying the market is wrong about uh, choosing the current system versus another system? And uh, I think there are many opinions, but in the end, the choices of the market really speak loudest, because that's where you have the intersection of personal freedom and personal interest that um, gives you the best answer. It's really hot up here. <laughs> Is there a chance that Bitcoin will have better privacy protection or better anonymity in the future? A absolutely. There's not just a chance that Bitcoin will have better privacy protection or better anonymity. There are a number of uh, actively uh, tested uh, beta test level solutions that significantly increase the anonymity and privacy of Bitcoin. Bitcoin, at its core, is the first iteration is loosely pseudonymous. And if you if you invest a lot in very very good operational security, you can take it from 
loosely pseudonymous to weakly anonymous. And that's about as much as you can do. Um, developments such as confidential transactions, uh, which is a collaboration between, uh, I believe, Gre Gregory Maxwell and Peter Wool, um, which allows for uh, in ring, ring encryption of the value of a transaction. Uh, that's a very important development. Um, Schnorr signatures, um, some of the features that are coming out of the Lightning Network that will allow you to essentially have an off-chain, onion-routed, multi-party, double-blind, store-and-forward network without really knowing who is sending what to who. And that's a whole layer you could put over Bitcoin. Um, all of these developments, both on their own, increase the fungibility, anonymity, and privacy of the network. Put together, uh, they can make Bitcoin and, quite honestly, many of the other open blockchains very, very strongly uh, anonymous. But something else, again, which you have to look at is the ecosystem. Because if I have Bitcoin and I also have Monero and Dash and Zcash, um, then I actually have the opportunity to use the currency that gives me the right level of privacy now, right? and, or use the, the currency that gives me the, the right level of security, or the right level of value store, or the right level of retail access, if that's what I care about, and switch between them. And switch between them at very low cost, and very quickly, and perhaps even in a programmatic and automated fashion, until your wallet picks the currency that is most suitable for the current use. Maybe if you have Tor on and you're buying something on a website, then it automatically switches to use Zcash because it says, "Okay, well, we're in a privacy mode right now, um, and maybe that's what you need." So I'm actually very optimistic about these developments. I think we're seeing, as I said before, this innovation, this momentum is picking up, and everybody's like. Oh, look over there. You see the block size problem they have? They can't solve it. They're not talking to each other. Meanwhile, right behind them, there's these <laughs> giant teams doing incredible innovation in Bitcoin. And, and there's this big, big, shiny distraction. Um, I hope the banks continue to underestimate Bitcoin because of the block size drama. And don't pay attention to the innovation that is picking up momentum. Um, I just want to be, I guess, succinct about it. I see two different parts forming. So one is the, well, are the people that are technically knowledgeable, they know how to use Bitcoin in an anonymous manner. But these, for me, would be the minority in comparison to the mass adoption of Bitcoin, which would be required for it to become globally used as a, you know, a universal currency. So my concern is, is it is it even feasible, or is it even a possibility that? You know, you got the technical community, and they are doing it in an anonymous way, or a more advanced way. And then you've got the normal way, which would be the banks, for example, in the Netherlands, that added a Bitcoin wallet to their online banking. Right. And they're saying, "Hey, guys, look, thanks for making Bitcoin become what it is. We'll take it from here." And they just kind of take this in and take the mass adoption themselves, and tell people, "Yeah, you easily this on your online banking, no problem. You know, we'll add it for you." Oh. And then they have a complete database of all the transactions, everything people do, as you referred to it before. And that, for me, is a huge concern because yes. you know, it's like the work was done by the people pushing for liberty and freedom or um, whatever the reason may have been. And then you know, what if they come in just like, yeah, thanks, we got it from here. Yeah, th that's happening. The future of money is going to be purely digital, digital currencies. By the time your children grow up, they will see cash in museums. And it will be banned everywhere. Um, cash as a mechanism will gradually be withdrawn until the only people who use it are the same people who go to a cafe here and say, "Do you accept gold?" <laughs> and the cafe owner goes, "Excuse me, <laughs> gold. I have gold coins." Um, so you're going to be the grandpa kook who is just weird and wants to pay in cash. Um, in a world where currencies will become digital, 
and we will have a choice. Do we want digital currencies that have borders, that are controlled by governments, that are giant surveillance mechanisms? Those will be available. Or do we want to use currencies that are open, borderless, and anonymous? And in order to make the second option appealing to people, we need better user interface design, better infrastructure, better software development, so that anonymity is not a choice. It is built into the everyday activity. It simply becomes an essential characteristic of the system. Now, the, good, uh, the good news is, the advantage here is, that there's almost five billion, four and a half to five billion people who have very, very limited access to banking, who are not being served by the existing systems. And if we get them to, uh, to leapfrog the technology and just go directly to uh, broadly anonymous digital currencies based on open blockchains, uh, then we have the majority of the population of this planet utilizing the free system of money, and the, there is a minority that will continue to use the slave system of money. And that is going to be a fundamental choice that people will face in the future. If you have these two systems juxtaposed in parallel, and one of them is closed, because in order to apply control, you must close all of the doors. You cannot have an open, borderless, immutable, censorship-resistant, open innovation, open access, permissionless system if it is run by a single entity that controls the blockchain. Because if they control it, they then automatically have a responsibility to censor any transactions that every government chooses to tell them are not allowed. So they will have to close it. They cannot swallow the bitter pill of an open, borderless system. They will choke on it, and that is great, because they will build a closed system. And the closed system will be limited in use, and most importantly, it will be a system of closed innovation. And it will innovate slowly. It will become the intranet of money, where you run the Microsoft Outlook of blockchain wallets. <laughs> and there will be some, some people who use it. The same people who ask you to fax them a document and send you a Microsoft Word document full of viruses and um, communicate by email and call you on the telephone, which I haven't done in two years. Um, there will be people who use that, and the banks and the governments will be left surveilling the innocent and the idiots uh, on these antiquated systems. But meanwhile, what happens to the open systems? They feed on each other, and they explode in innovation. And they start delivering applications you simply cannot do on the closed systems. Right? So, to me, I don't fear this comparison. But what I do recognize is the one lesson we learned from the internet is that if you want to make privacy effective on a broad scale, you make it invisible. You make it on by default, and you make it broadly available and easy to use. The most widely spread system of cryptography, as broken as it is, is a little green padlock in the top corner of your browser that you didn't ask for. And that's why it's magical. How many people in here use PGP? You are not a mainstream audience. <laughs> Uh, just for the people who are watching from the cameras, that was about two-thirds to three-quarters of the audience. How many people here use SSL? Okay, that's a trick question. We all do, right? And so does my mom, and so does your grandma, and so does your grandpa, and your weird uncle who doesn't trust computers, and they still use SSL, and they don't even know they use SSL. And that's effective security. When we make privacy and anonymity in blockchain systems invisible, easy to use, on by default, and then we add to that open innovation to create applications that are unimaginable in the closed systems, that serve the needs of tiny minorities but empower them incredibly, that are completely borderless in nature, if that is the basis of competition, we win, without a doubt. Okay, I think that was the last question. Thank you so much. Thank you. What's your opinion on Steam? <laughs> of Steve? Steve. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm just going through my head and thinking about all of the Steves I know, and I'm like, hmm, what could I possibly say? Um, Steam. I haven't used the system myself. Um, I have been asked by dozens and dozens and dozens of people to use it, uh, usually with a promise that if I do use it, I will make thousands and thousands of dollars very, very quickly and easily. When I get that kind of sales pitch, I start getting very suspicious. Um, I don't like the way that instead of focusing on quality of content and things like that and building community organically, a lot of the pitch I hear from people who are interested in Steam seems to revolve around the idea that if you use it, you can make a lot of money fast. That's always a red flag for me. Now, that may be a misunderstanding of its potential, and in fact, it may be a fantastically visionary system. I've looked at all of these. I think there is a very interesting set of parameters that make the con combination of social media, micropayments, and kind of behavioral incentives and disincentives around producing good content and not being a trollish asshole. Um, those parameters come together and make for some very interesting platform. If uh, every time somebody wanted to say something nasty about me on Reddit, they had to put down a 25 cent deposit. And if the community voted that they were being a troll, I got the 25 cents. Now that would be a get rich quick scheme <laughs> for me. <laughs> so um, you know I'm very interested in, in kind of the both the social aspects, but really not using money as a system of remuneration, but using money as a system of kind of quality discovery through systems of incentives that are backed by game theoretical models at scale. Wisdom of the crowd plus micropayments plus behavioral science equals fewer trolls. That is fascinating to me. Um, and I know that Steam is aiming to do that, among other things, as I should probably mention uh, yours. and There's a bunch of others. I, I, I can't remember all of them right now. This is an emergent area, and I think we're going to see a lot of innovation. Now, keep in mind, social media platforms require a very high density of adoption before they're effective. There's a reason why Facebook didn't happen in 1995. Right? And it, it's not because nobody had come up with the idea. Um, it's because you need that critical density where you know enough people, and these people already have access to the underlying infrastructure, and are willing to engage in it, so that it starts becoming useful. And even then, it's a very difficult bootstrap. Bootstrapping social media in digital currencies, where you have a very limited community that is really just talking to each other, I think is going to be difficult for the next decade but very promising. Again, it's one of those things that will experiment and fail, and experiment and fail, and build momentum, and build momentum, and then one day you'll be like, oh, this is kind of almost as useful as Facebook. Oh, look, a week has passed, and now it's ten times more useful than Facebook, and then it goes vertical. Yeah. So just that you know, we have at least half an hour for questions We have at least more, half so an hour. Feel free to ask. And there will be a table here for the book signing after that. So Fantastic. That you know. If someone can get me a bottle question. of water before I faint from dehydration up here, in the oven that this stage has become. Okay. Um, who has a question? Me. Please. Uh, hello. Uh, I just would like to ask uh, because I'm like recently overwhelmed with all the like uh, ideas. Uh, what would be possible with blockchain and cryptocurrencies and stuff. Um, do you see anything which, from your point of view, it's not a good idea to be implemented on blockchain? Or oh, fantastic question. 80% um, of what people are saying is a good idea to be implemented on blockchain, added to that list of things that should not be implemented on a blockchain. Right now, Blockchain is the hammer, and everything looks like a nail, and people are going around and hitting things, uh, mostly breaking things, uh, and not really producing anything useful. The, the problem is nobody really knows what a blockchain is, um, and it's defined in such a ridiculously broad way. Um, 
And I, I'm going to be publishing an article about that and doing a talk about that. But a blockchain is the ultimate meaningless word. Um, and the bottom line is that we try to apply it anywhere we think we could add the words database plus trust plus transparency plus um, immutability, right? And the problem is that trust and transparency and immutability are not properties of the blockchain. They're properties of a system that combines a blockchain, uh, an open consensus mechanism with a proof of work investment and extrinsic energy, and a native asset that creates a game theoretical reward system, all working in conjunction to massively increase the decentralization of the system until its decentralization range is so high that suddenly immutability, security, transparency, openness emerge as characteristics. And so we're like, let's do all of that without the decentralization. I have some really simple advice for you. If you like this advice and it helps you revolutionize your business, please send me a Bitcoin donation. If you are currently involved in a large corporate proof of concept research project where some consultant is selling you blockchain, not proper noun, abstract noun, blockchain, just generally. <laughs> Let's do blockchain, not a blockchain, not the blockchain, not one blockchain, just blockchain as a general concept. If they're using words like that, and they're telling you that the system that you have now can be replaced with a blockchain, and suddenly all of these magical characteristics will, involve, will evolve from it. This is the same business model that we saw in 2000 on the internet. One, existing business. Two, build a website. Three, question mark, question mark. Four, profit! <laughs> and it fails at the three place. <laughs> Um, where you suddenly discover that I don't know, creating an Uber of laundry to wash other people's clothes is not a winning business model. <laughs> um, so here's my free advice: take the word blockchain from the consulting research proposal, don't fund it, and do a search and replace through the document, and replace it with Microsoft SQL Server Data Center Edition. And if the proposal still works from an IT perspective, buy that instead. There, I just saved you a million dollars. I'll take a small commission, send it to my Bitcoin address. If you're using blockchain to mean a database and we added some hashes and signatures, you are missing the point. The magic of this technology is the decentralization. And to remove the decentralization, is to remove what makes it magic. I have a simple analogy. This is as if a consultant comes to you and says, "Listen, you know this new amazing thing called aviation? Well, the technology behind aviation is wings. So, we propose to add wings to cruise ships, and by adding wings to cruise ships, given enough propulsion energy and time, we will soon achieve aviation." You are not going to lift 150,000 metric tons with the included buffet cafeteria, Olympic-sized swimming pool, and amphitheater for musical productions into the air just because you added wings, because wings is not the technology behind aviation. You are not going to achieve aviation. Um, and I will go into that in more detail in a future talk, but the bottom line is that blockchain is one component of a whole set of technologies that work in conjunction to achieve one thing, and one thing that matters only, decentralization. That is the measure of success. That is what all of the interesting characteristics emerge from. And you can't do without the decentralization, right? All right. Let's see. Another yeah. Okay. So is it possible that for example NSA builds quantum computer that will be able to break Bitcoin crypto? Yes. <laughs> it is certain that the NSA has already built 
quantum computers, because Google has one in their data center, and if they have one, the NSA has one that's ten times better, <laughs> that costs as much as a moon mission, um, and that can break encryption systems at a much, much better rate and with more efficiency. Now, here's the interesting question. Do they use that to break Bitcoin? And the simple answer is no. And we know from history that if you have such a thing, this is the most important and well-guarded secret. Anytime you use it, you have to come up with a parallel story, a parallel construction story that tells the world how you managed to break that encryption without using such a thing, because such a thing doesn't exist. When the British captured Enigma, they would let ships sink because they didn't have a good enough story of how they knew the U-boat was going to be there. They let cities be bombed, because they didn't have a good enough story of how they knew that they were going to be bombed. And so if they couldn't create a good enough story, they could not risk revealing the most important secret they had. So, for one thing, the last thing they're going to use that on is Bitcoin, because the moment you use it on Bitcoin and you announce to the world we have quantum cryptography that can build elliptic curve, guess what happens? Your nuclear rivals upgrade their cryptography very easily and try to implement quantum resistant cryptographic algorithms, of which there is a lot of research and a lot of suitable candidates. And you just blew all of your research and advancement in that technology on fighting a shitty little currency that some weirdos use in Prague. <laughs> <laughs> no, the NSA is not going to hack us with their quantum computer to change some easy... Now, the interesting thing is, what happens is that technology becomes commercially viable and more broadly available. And that's where you see two of Satoshi's initial design choices that, in retrospect, are absolutely genius. First of all, Bitcoin uses two fundamental cryptographic systems in order to achieve its security. One is elliptic curve multiplication on a prime field, which is a one-way function. Now, that depends on prime factorization mathematics, which is vulnerable to quantum technology. The other is hash algorithms. And hash algorithms are not actually factorizable with quantum technology. We don't have very good algorithms for breaking hashes with, with quantum computing. So, what does Satoshi do? He doesn't put the elliptic curve public keys in the transactions until after they've been spent. What you use, which is a Bitcoin address, is a double hashed version of your public key, which means that the public key is never seen by anyone until you claim it by spending the transaction. And therefore, if you use the fundamental best practice in Bitcoin, which is only use an address once, use a different address for every transaction, spend it completely every time you use it, and redirect the change to a new address, the first time your public key is advertised on the network is the moment that it no longer contains any money. Go ahead and crack it. You've got an empty address. And that means that you can't go back and look at keys that were addresses three years ago and simply crack them, because you don't have the public keys. All you have, if they haven't been spent, is the double hash of an address. This little genius design element is not an accident. What it does is it creates a second layer abstraction of the underlying cryptographic algorithm used in elliptic curve digital signatures, allowing you to do future upgrades which means that the past is secure because it's hidden behind the second veil of a different algorithm, and the future can be changed because you can present an address that is not the hash of an elliptic curve, or it's the hash of a different elliptic curve, or if it's the hash of a bigger elliptic curve, or it's the hash of a signing algorithm that is quantum resistant that has nothing to do with elliptic curve. So you can do forwards modification to secure the future, and you've got backwards protection because you hid the past. A brilliant little design element that most people have missed. So quantum computers, we upgrade. We will have to upgrade ECDSA. Every cryptographic algorithm ever invented has a shelf life of between 20, 30 years, 
and then it becomes vulnerable to broadly available commercial technology that can crack it. And you upgrade. It's a continuous arms race. We can't keep the same one forever. But the good news is, we can upgrade. In fact, now with some of the new technologies like segregated witness, we're going to introduce a completely new signing mechanism. And by we, I mean the people who are much smarter than me and understand cryptography, um, which involves Schnorr signatures. Um, Greg Maxwell has implemented a new system which involves ring signatures, uh, and all of these are completely new signature systems. And at some point, I think we're going to have a system in Bitcoin where you can choose, just as you can in PGP, which encryption algorithm and signing algorithm you want to use for your transactions, and there'll be a whole suite of these that get changed over time. That was a slightly more technical question. I appreciate it. Um, I hope that answer was understandable. Um, I got two questions. Thank you for your talk, Andreas. Um, the first would be, a couple of days ago I read an article or news that uh, some company invented an edible blockchain, and I thought, wow, finally we solved world hunger. Uh, we did a little bit of blockchain. Then yep. I read it again, and it was ed editable, so I'm just face palmed. Um, <laughs> the question is, how do we hinder random suits of patenting random stuff in the space and hindering the innovation that is happening by the whole fact of this thing being open source? And the second question is, uh, before you had a very nice analogy between GPG and SSL, and why the one is used by many people and why the one not, and that is, well, because the browser does everything for us very easily. And the browser in Bitcoin is pretty much, the, as I see it, is the Bitcoin wallet or yes. whatever wallet you use. And, um, and I would love to see there more innovation in that space. So my question for you would be, uh, what features do you would love to see in future wallets? What should we focus on to make it more easy to use for the average person and more usable? Um, okay, great. Let me tackle the first one, which is the edible or editable uh, blockchain. Um, it, it, you know, the, I'm not really worried about patents because patents really affect only the commercial companies in the space that are interested in doing commercial and proprietary technology. Quite honestly, if they're not fighting against patents, getting organized to create patent pools, which I have suggested and participated in groups to do, uh, then they are going to pay the price, and they're going to spend a lot of their time in litigation over stupid, crappy patents over things that are common generic algorithms or systems that were invented by other people. Um, and we're going to see these fights break out, and quite honestly, they're not going to affect the most important thing, which is the broadly available volunteer-based open source software that we really care about, because you can't stop that with patents. Uh, they will slow down the proprietary software companies. Uh, they live in a world they built, and, uh, and they're not actually doing enough to fight these parasitic patent companies. Um, and, and I think you're going to see that problem. As for patenting an editable blockchain, um, you know, I, I, I've expressed my um, confusion as to why someone would miss the fact that irreversibility of a contractual agreement between two parties, one that may allow for refunds and multi-sig and consumer protection programmed in, or may just be a payment, that irreversibility is not a bug. It is the most useful feature, or one of the most useful features of this. It is a system that encourages autonomy instead of authority. It dodges the fundamental question of if you have authority to change and edit the blockchain. Editable blockchain is nice. It's passive voice, isn't it? Uh, what they patented is a system by which they can edit the blockchain. It's important to understand who the subject in that sentence is. An editable blockchain is a blockchain that can be edited, which brings up the question by whom and under what circumstances, which is the most important question. An editable blockchain that can be edited by a committee, an institutional authority, a hierarchy, a government agency, uh, whatever, 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 is really not a useful construct. We already have those. Again, I refer you to SQL databases with digital signatures. Um, we already have institutional money. We already have authoritarian systems. We already have systems of authority and control and censorship. 
What we have now is non-editable systems of freedom and autonomy and censorship resistance and free expression and the ability to enter into contracts between individuals that are encoded in a Bitcoin script and which are absolutely inviolable and guaranteed to perform exactly as expected. At least in the Bitcoin system, with its constraints, that is a promise that is very, very strong. And that strong promise is not a bug. It is one of the most interesting features. So I expect the next patent they are going to file is for the uh, open-air convertible submarine with a drop-down soft top. Um, you know, and, and other things like that, which are uh, really may, maybe the microwave oven without a door, so you can get a tan while you are cooking your burrito. Um, all of these are things that they can patent. Uh, patenting something doesn't mean it's useful, novel, or interesting. It just means that you first paid a consultant to come up with some nonsense, and then paid a lawyer to make that nonsense part of the permanent record, so that you can be forever embarrassed by it. Um, to your, uh, could you? Remind me, what was the second part of the question? Uh, wallets. wallets, yes. Wallets are the, the, the fundamental nexus of innovation, because they are the fundamental user interface. They are the mechanism by which a person interacts with the system. Um, but also, the same applies to API-based systems, where machines are interacting with the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, or other open blockchains. Um, wallets, their user interface, their design characteristics, their ease of use, their workflows, they are the basis by which we will understand or fail to understand this technology, be able to use or fail to be able to use, uh, be able to expand or fail to expand uh, this technology. And you say there is not much innovation in wallets. Uh, I accept that it seems, again, it seems very slow at first as it builds momentum. I remember when there was one wallet for Bitcoin. Uh, it was called QT. Um, and then we had lots of nodes on the network, because <laughs> you needed to run a full node just to have a wallet. And now we don't have as many nodes. Um, and apparently that's a problem. Uh, I remember the first SPV wallet. I remember the first um, uh, mobile wallet uh, written on Android by Andreas Schilbach. Uh, who I met recently in Berlin. He's an amazing person. Um, and that's the first mobile wallet I used. And then there were two. And from two we went to twenty, and then from twenty we went to two hundred, and soon we'll have twenty thousand wallets, and most of them will be crap. But in the process we now have five or six really, really, really good wallets. Uh, wallets that offer us ease of use, ease of backup. Uh, extensibility, recoverability, resilience, um, security. Uh, okay, I'm going to do this. I don't normally do this in public, but I would like to say there are a bunch of people in this room who invented BIP39 mnemonic phrases that completely revolutionized how easy wallets are to use. So, round of applause for that team. I go around the world and I tell people, your entire Bitcoin wallet can be uh, sprayed as graffiti on a wall in the form of 12 English words, and you can share that with the world. How the hell do you stop that? You can transmit your entire wallet by writing it on a piece of paper and recovering it, memorizing 12 words, and walking across a tightly controlled border where currencies are confiscated, and arrive unscathed on the other side. Uh, you can recover all of your transactions and all of your money. Wallets have made enormous progress in the last two years. And I think we are missing the fact that they are getting even better. Um, several new features that are going to revolutionize wallets. Uh, segregated witness, with its ability to add uh, commitment signatures to input values, make wallets a lot easier to do, especially offline wallets. Um, uh, the ability to do lightweight transactions with segregated witness. Payment channels and Lightning Network will be mind-blowing in its applications for wallets. It is going to take at least three years until you see those applications. 
but then they will accelerate. Um, and I hope to see a, a whole slew of wallets that are dedicated to specific communities, wallets that support people with disabilities, wallets that support people with all kinds of different languages and number systems and uh, cultural practices, etc. Um, and that is one of the things we have to realize, which is we are going to get a lot of diversity here. This is not going to be um, you know, one or two wallets that everybody uses. I mean, that would be a disaster. Instead, what I hope to see is a Pareto distribution, a power law of wallets. You have you know, five or six wallets that have 60% of the user population, and then you have 10,000 wallets, each for a tiny, tiny niche that serve many different purposes. Um, this is a brand new field. It is growing very, very fast. The momentum is picking up. All of this is open source. Uh, the various wallets um, use each other to discover new ways of doing things. Um, reusable payment codes is another fantastic innovation that gives you stealth addresses combined with hierarchical deterministic wallets. Uh, that has been implemented in one of the wallets I was looking at recently, which is called Samurai Wallet, that is focused on privacy. And the other really interesting feature is that you see wallets that are focused on solving specific needs. Some are about, as I said, ease of use, some are about convenience, some are about retail applications, and some are about very, very, very strong privacy. So I'm very optimistic about wallets. Yes. From what I've observed, uh, I think that privacy and anonymity always comes with some cost. Like uh, in Monero, you ha have uh, bigger transactions. With confidential transactions, you need like uh, I think 54 uh, ring signatures to instead of one, uh, and so so don't don't you think that uh, such cost w could uh, prevent the mass adoption of privacy by default? Absolutely. Uh, privacy is inefficient, privacy is costly, privacy takes commitment and sacrifice and effort to implement. And certainly a lot of the people in this room uh, are people who believe that that trade-off is one worth paying because it pays back in the currency of freedom. And you never really uh, appreciate freedom until you don't have it. Um, we are extremely privileged, but there are many, many places in the world where the trade-off of cost efficiency and bandwidth efficiency and time efficiency and complexity compared to the value of freedom is a very, very, very easy trade-off. And I, I think that being able to serve that particular community is really important. Uh, privacy is not easy. I mean, how, how many how many people in 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 this room? are able to make the trade-offs necessary, even very, very committed people. I, I don't think you'll find that many. Um, and so, unfortunately for most people, uh, privacy is not an issue, uh, and freedom is not an issue until you start feeling its loss. Uh, and by that time, it's usually uh, too late. Hello, Andres. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um... Just recently, we were discussing a lot about currencies and uh, basically uh, one global currency referring to, and uh, one made up the, let's say, the opinion that Bitcoin might become a global currency where other fiat currencies are uh, kind of seeing it as a reference of value. Uh, what's your take on that? Do the, would it ever go there? to replace the dollar and have a Bitcoin as the global currency everybody is referring to? I, I think that world view of uh, competition in which one currency wins and becomes a de facto and only standard at the exclusion of all others is a model that can only be supported by war. It is a model that can only be supported by coercion and violence and monopoly. And it is fundamentally a statist perspective of a zero-sum game in which you only win if you crush the opponent. Um, Bitcoin does not represent a zero-sum game. It represents a choice that you have in addition to everything that already exists, that does not need to displace or replace or force anyone to use it. And certainly, I think a system by which Bitcoin becomes a mandatory system, um, you know, some, I was asked by a journalist once, do you think that the euro could adopt a digital currency like 
uh, Bitcoin or something like it to replace the euro. And I was like, that's a complete fascist dystopia, as if the euro itself wasn't already bad enough. <laughs> um, One world currency means one world authority means one world governance system means one world culture. It's as likely as one world religion. It's as likely as one world language. It's as likely as one world culture. We are not a one world. We are uh, we are many, and and so I, to me, Bitcoin represents the choice to use alternatives where otherwise it would be prohibited to use alternatives. Bitcoin is a global currency. Bitcoin is the de facto currency of the internet today. Bitcoin is the most uh, successful open borderless uh, currency that has ever existed. It is already a reference of value for many of the people in this room. It is my income and has been for the last three years almost exclusively. Um, it is a foundation of uh, my ability to travel around the world and do these things. I am already using it as my preferred currency for the vast majority of my expenses. And I do that voluntarily, and no one has to follow me. They have to follow me only through the persuasion of my arguments and ideas. It is an open market, voluntary system. And I think the idea of imposing that on a nationalist and border basis, or any ag aggregation of states, is is fundamentally wrong. So no country will choose to implement a digital currency unless that digital currency is a centralized control statist nightmare of surveillance, in which case you probably shouldn't use it. No country will almost certainly choose to use Bitcoin because they don't have to, because it is meaningless for a country to choose to use Bitcoin, because a country is just its people. And if its people choose to use Bitcoin, they will even if their government disagrees, and if they don't, they will even if their government wants them to. Um, we are associating currencies with flags and nation states and top-down authority and the respectability and uh, credibility that comes from a central issuer, and those are all notions uh, that are completely antiquated in every way. Um, so, just choose. All right, let's take another question. Yes. Hey, so on the subject on of uh, wallets and security and privacy. I sure. Uh, so blockchain.info wallet was very innovative and been around for a long time and kind of pioneered the architecture, I think, of uh, client-side, trustless uh, way of doing the wallets. Mm -hmm. And they had also had a coin join feature for yes. a long time, I, I think multiple years. That's just a simple checkbox. Do you want to have your transaction be anonymous? Yes. Uh, and they disabled that, I think, like a, f a couple of months ago or something? I, I think just, so. I'm not sure. Okay, so I, oh, I was just wondering if you had any insight on why they did that. It may be a technical reason that I'm not aware of. And then, uh, I have no insight or ability to comment on what a pro you know. It's a private company. I have no association with them. Okay. Um, I think it's 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 obviously disappointing because if they did disable that, that was a useful feature that a lot of people found useful. But on the other hand. There is a very big difference between the, the Bitcoin blockchain in 2013, 2014, where that was the only option, versus the world we live in today, where if you want to use CoinJoin, one of the easiest ways to do it is go on Shapeshift, and Bitcoin to Dash to Monero to Zcash to Dash to Monero to Zcash to Monero to Monero to D <laughs> back to Bitcoin. Right. Add a bit of Litecoin in there, maybe some Ethereum for fun. That's Maybe some classic. Yeah, Mix I think it all up. Should pretty much get back it. into Bitcoin. Well, you coin joined. I mean, you don't really need to use it as an application. You can use it as an entire chain, and that's part of what the ecosystem offers us now. Um, and there are many alternatives. There's also yeah, peer-to-peer -peer network. I think it's called Join Market. If someone might correct me, which is a a, a peer-to-peer software-based thing, which is serverless. Uh, and essentially does the same thing uh, in a broadly applicable way. One of the problems with CoinJoin and such an anonymization and privacy technologies 
is that the main weakness they have is that you can do statistical analysis on the transferred values and, and create associations and correlations from that. And that's what uh, confidential transactions attacks directly, which is really good. Mm. What, uh, what's confidential transactions? Uh, confidential transactions is a um, software implementation of homomorphic encryption using ring signatures, as best I can understand it, oh. uh, which is implemented uh, as a test bed on the Elements Alpha sidechain run by uh, Blockstream, uh, which was an invention initiated by, among others, uh, Gregory Maxwell, I think Peter Wool, and a bunch of other developers. It's actually working today. You can run it on the Alpha chain. Uh, and it's one of the things that is proposed as a soft fork upgrade after segregated witness to bring it straight into Bitcoin. Okay, so that, that was it? the last question. All I right. have a few announcements, but first, please, uh, thanks. Thank to you so much. Thank you, Andreas Antopanos. Thank you.